last week I finally gave up and said whatever we were seeing there must, must be something, something different. Uh, so what I'm going to talk about today is a little bit different um, and it's not quite as directly linked to the scientific theme of the meeting, but it includes a lot of really different types of data. So maybe it'll be interesting to kind of think of a press to think about how do we kind of archive and link to these data source data, different data types from different sources. So instead of talking about magnetic instability, I'm going to talk about magnetic stability, uh, which is probably a good thing, right, of uh, lower crustal rocks um, from Atlantis Bank at the Southwest Indian Ridge that were collected during Expedition 360 um, of the uh, IODP Expedition 360 about um, a year ago, and kind of why that stability may have been called into question and why it's important for our interpretation of the data. Um, so the other paleomagnetists on board with me were Anthony Morris from uh, Plymouth and Morris Heidi from, from Woods Hole. And of course, like every IODP expedition, they only result because of an extreme amount of really hard work by a ton of people. So this is um, you know, the result of lots of other people besides just us. Um, so I wanna you know, thank all the ship's crew and staff that were out with us, as well as all the other IODP staff um, that that make sure these expeditions happen. So like Brad and Katarina. Um, and, all right. All right, so just a little preview of the talk. I'll go over kind of just very broadly some of the, the motivations for the expedition and the overall background and goals for that. Um, and then I'll just give you a little bit of um, preliminary results of the lithology recovered and the shipboard paleomagnetic data. Um, and again, why we might be concerned about the stability um, of some of the, the magnetization. And then I'll go into some of the, the post-cruise rock magnetic data. And then finally, I'll, I'll show hopefully a little bit of uh, very preliminary work linking the specific rock magnetic results to uh, specific mineralogies in the rocks. And that's still kind of very much in progress. But since this is a database meeting, I thought I would highlight all of the different databases that are involved that will ultimately be involved in this project. So this includes, let me think. Um, right, the IODP database, which is a publicly available database. So all this data will be publicly available um, once the moratorium period is ended. Um, some of the data were collected at the IRM, Institute for Rock Magnetism, and they have their own internal database, um, which is not publicly available, but it is remotely accessible, right? So I can log into the IRM database and do some manipulation of my data using tools that they've developed. And if you wanna know more about the IRM database, you should see Pete Solhide's poster out uh, at the break. Um, and then some of the data were collected in my lab, the Paleomagnetic Lab at, um, UW Milwaukee, and I guess calling our data management system a database is a little bit grandiose, but um, we'll, we'll throw it up there anyway. So eventually, when this is published, right, all the data from these different data sources will be um, then imported into MAGIC. So let's get back to the science. So um, this is where we were at. So um, this is the southern tip of Africa. This is Madagascar. South, I can barely see this. Southwest Indian Ridge comes through here. Um, so this is where Expedition 360 was. And this is not the first time the drilling program has been here. Uh, hole 735B was drilled at the same location. Um, and so this is some place we've been returning to. Um, this is a little close-up of the area, um, just to give you an idea of the geologic setting. Uh, so here's the ridge axis, and here's the Atlantis transform. Um, Atlantis Bank is right here. It's this kind of elevated platform uh, right close to the transform. And one of the reasons uh, that this place is interesting is because it's been tectonically unroofed. So the upper crust has been removed. This is not uncommon in kind of slow spreading situations, um, especially at this so-called inside corner of the ridge transform intersection. Um, 
you have a magmatic extension that's accommodated along um, a detachment fault that's kind of looks some, may look something like this, where at depth the fault is steep, and then as you get further away from the axis, the, the fault rolls over. Uh, but then here you've exposed all the lower crustal rocks where they're easy, easier for us to get at. And also that kind of rotation is something that then can be um, constrained with the paleomagnetic data. Um, all right. So um, here is another <laughs> close-up of the region, the ridge axis, and the transform. And this is, um, is shown here. This is kind of blown up over here just to show you the, the geology, uh, the geological map. Um, so the Pillow basalts are this kind of orange color. The um, yellows are the gabbros, and the greens are kind of peridotites and serpentinites. And so here's the 735B, um, the previous deep hole in this location, 1105A is a shorter hole nearby. And then here's the, the new hole um, that we drilled during Expedition 360. All right. So what was the point of going back here? So this whole ex, um, drilling program was kind of envisioned as a three-leg expedition with one of the ultimate goals being to drill through um, both the crust mantle transition, so the petrological crust mantle transition, and through the seismic moho, when the hypothesis being that in this particular setting and perhaps in many slow spreading sets, Flow spread settings, those two things are not equivalent. Um, but this was the first leg, right? so we never expected to get deep enough to drill through the Moho. So kind of the overarching goals related to this particular expedition were related to just recovery of the in situ igneous lower crust um, at kind of a slow spread rate. And because we already have all this great data from 735B, I mean, another hole nearby allows us to assess the degree of heterogeneity or variability in the, this slow spread lower crust. Um, and an additional goal was we thought, uh, we had hoped we were going to drill through a magnetic polarity boundary. Um, and we could maybe say something a little bit more about what the nature of magnetic anomalies recorded in the lower crust. We didn't actually do that, so um, save that for the next, uh, the next group. All right, so um, kind of broadly speaking, the roles of the magnetics that kind of tie in with some of the, um, the other goals of the expedition involve, um, as I just said, kind of maybe better understanding the nature of the magnetic anomalies, uh, the reversals in the lower crust. You can use some of the data, the paleomagnetic data to constrain the thermal history, the rotation, the uplift of Atlantis Bank, kind of the tectonic history of it. And if we look at the magnetic fabrics, we can place some constraints on the subsolidus shear, shear deformation. Um, and finally, we can maybe say something about the, the remnants carriers in the lower crust. So what I'm going to talk about is basically kind of trying to link these, the first and the last of these. Um, so one of the other really nice things about this location um, is even though the upper crust has been completely removed, it still carries very distinct uh, magnetic anomalies that are observed in the sea surface and the deep toe data. So the lower crust here is clearly contributing to the marine magnetic anomalies, and that's something we've known for a long time, but this is a really nice, uh, a nice demonstration of that. So um, this here is kind of a simplified map of the magnetic anomalies. This is Atlantis Bank, the, the platform, um, the Dark shading are the uh, normal, and the, uh, the white is the mirrors. Um, and then if you go over here, we have the, um, this is the sea surface magnetic anomaly data over Atlantis um, Bank platform. The um, solid lines here are the near bottom data. And then the dashed line is a model, a forward model, uh, based on uh, kind of this very simplified model that uh, kind of envisions the anomaly batter patterns as uh, boundaries as kind of linearly line linear and dipping uh, dipping downwards to the south. Um, so this model was put together before our expedition. So it was constrained by the, the magnetic anomaly data, 
as well as some paleomagnetic data taken from the surface of the platform and by uh, the data in 735B. Um, so you can see this is why we thought we were going to drill through the boundary. This is our, uh, our hole, 1473A. Um, and the red is the, the depth of penetration that we achieved, but we did not actually drill, drill through that boundary. Um, but the point here is that if we want to um, kind of accurately model these anomalies, we have to know something about what's generating the anomalies. So we have to know something about the magnetization, um, what's carrying the remnants, and what, what might be carrying an induced magnetization as well that would be contributing to these anomalies. So if we start to look at the lithologies that are recovered um, from kind of all these different holes, you might be able to see why, um, why it's important to think about how stable is the remnants, is there an induced component. So um, this is from 735B, these are 1105A, they were very short holes, and then this is our, um, our data here. So of the rocks that were recovered, these colors are showing what fraction uh, belongs to which type of lithology. So the blues are kind of gabbros and olivine gabbros um, with basically no visible oxides in them. Um, the yellows and the oranges um, are kind of disseminated oxide gabbros, oxide bearing gabbros, which have less than 5% oxides. And then the reds were termed oxide gabbros, they have more than 5% oxide in them. So um, you'll note a couple of things. These kind of oxide-bearing gabbros tend to be more concentrated close to the top of the platform. Uh, they have all these oxides in them, so as you expect, they're also highly magnetic. So you have, they may, so they may be contributing more strongly to those near-bottom anomalies than some of the other lithologies. Um, these are also extremely coarse oxides, so you know, kind of up to half a centimeter in diameter, right? So general rule of thumb is if you can see the oxides in your rock, like here with the unaided eye, that's probably not a good paleomagnetic recorder. Um, but, but we'll see that, that that's probably not true in this case. So um, let's go on. So we can look at just some kind of preliminary magnetic data from these different types of lithologies. Um, so here are basically the generic gabbros with kind of no visible oxides. This is um, just showing histogram of um, NRM intensity and susceptibility. Um, these are the rocks with less than 5% visible oxide and more than 5% oxide. So you can see this is a log scale. And of course, the oxide gabbros are certainly more magnetic. Um, but the distribution on, on each of these, um, they're kind of, all the distributions are strongly overlapping. Um, so if we want to know more about how they're contributing to the marine magnetic anomalies, we have to think about kind of the relationship between the remnants carrying capacity and capacity for an induced magnetization. Um, so that's what's shown here. We have the NRM on this axis, and this says susceptibility. This is, this is actually susceptibility times applied field. So this is the induced magnetization. So the remnant magnetization versus the induced magnetization. Um, and if we want to quantify that, we can take the ratio, and we call that the Koenigsberger ratio. That's represented by Q here. So for Q equals 1, that means the anomalies would be generated equally by the remnant and the induced um, component of the rocks. So most of the data here do fall kind of um, higher than one, meaning they're more controlled by the remnant magnetization. But that's probably an overestimate because there is a drilling overprint on these rocks um, that, will, that will overestimate that. Um, so I don't want to dwell on this too much, but um, these are just some kind of preliminary, these are uh, AF and thermal demagnetization of samples cut from the working half of the core. These were done shipboard. Um, so you can kind of see basically almost all of the samples we were able to isolate a stable, um, high coercivity, high temperature component. So the ones, these two here are, um, 
we have some of the oxide bearing gabbros and the rest are the gabbros with no visible oxides. Um, and you get kind of, in the ones with no visible oxides, you have um, kind of very easily demagnetized samples, low corrosivity. Um, you also have high corrosivity samples. And then even in the ones with more oxides, you get some that also you know, have a very nice high corrosivity component. So it's not kind of this very simple picture of uh, you know, where all of the oxide gabbros with these really coarse gabbros have a very unstable remnants. Um, and this is basically just a summary of the paleomagnetic results showing um, that we get Basically, so this is the expected dipole direction shown with the red dashed line. And we get something that's significantly steeper than that. The inclination is significantly steeper than that, um, which is telling us something about the rotation of the platform. Um, and I'm not going to spend too much time on this. So basically, here's again our lithology variation down core, and there's no correlation between lithology type and, and the inclination that we are able to recover from the rocks. Um, Kind of as a side note, the inclination that we recover is basically the same thing that everyone else who's worked in this location has also recovered. So it's good. We're getting very kind of reproducible results. Um, there are some kind of interesting downhole variations that we see that I won't talk about here. Um, but combined, all of the data um, suggests that there's at least a 20 degree kind of back tilt um, along that fault as it's, as it's rolled over. Um, all right, so if we want to know what's carrying the remnants. We can start just by looking at some of the microscope observations. Um, in the upper part of the hole where there's more of these coarse-grained oxide gabbros, you can definitely see right, this, these, are, these are in um, transmitted light, so you have the opaque oxides that are showing up. Here's the 1,000 micron uh, scale bar, so these are quite large. Um, these are kind of primary magmatic titanomagnetite, hemoilmanite. Um, down here in reflected light, um, you can see these are often intergross of ilmenite, and in this case, um, sulfides. Ilmenite does dominate over magnetite, and then here we have ilmenite intergrown with magnetite. In the lower part of the hole, we would expect kind of less of these as we get less of those coarse grained oxides and uh, more of some of the other types of magnetite that have been observed by uh, previous workers who did work on 735B. They um, observed kind of silicate-hosted, exolved, low titanium titanomagnetite um, that a few people have been talking about over the last couple of days, as well as some skeletal magnetite associated with alteration of, of olivine. Uh, so there's kind of three different types of magnetite that have been described in this location. Um, and in general, um, we kind of see kind of bulk magnetic properties that roughly mirror those observations. Um, here's, well, first of all, here's the strength of the NRM downhole, and you get kind of peaks in the NRM that are associated with the oxide gabber layers. Um, in general, NRM is more intense on the top of the hole than it is in the bottom. Um, median destructive field as a proxy for kind of coercivity. Um, is on average a bit higher in the lower part of the hole, but um, it's highly variable throughout. I should say on all of these plots, the, the little blue dots are taken from the archive path measurements of the impact cores, and the uh, red symbols are taken from discrete samples cut from the working path. Um, so in general, stability seems to increase a little bit downhole. Uh, there's an increase in the median destructive temperature and the Curie temperature downhole. Um, but let's look a little bit more at kind of some of the, the rock magnetic properties. Um, so here we're showing hysteresis that was collected on um, samples spanning the whole core. Um, basically, we get something that lies along the single domain, multi domain mixing curve. Um, nothing that's really just completely multi-domain, as you might expect you would get in those coarse oxides that have been previously described as extremely unstable, by the way. Um, 
So the color here is related to saturation magnetization, just as a way of trying to see if these highly magnetic oxides are in fact more kind of multi-domain like, um, less single domain like. And you can see that maybe, yes, a little bit, they, they tend to lie further down this curve than some of the, the less magnetic oxides. Um, but let's see if we can look at this in a little more detail. I'm gonna show you a few quark diagrams um, from these three samples on the next page. Um, so I guess there's probably a few people in the audience that aren't familiar with quarks, so I guess I'll give you my five second explanation. Um, I'm sure there's people here who could explain it better than me, but basically this is like hysteresis. Uh, it's also a measurement of magnetization versus applied field, but you're basically exploring kind of a bigger, a wider parameter space of um, magnetization states of the sample. So it allows us to kind of tease out different populations of magnetic um, domain states that may be present within the sample. So uh, these are plots of the fork, the resulting fork distribution. This axis, the horizontal axis, is linked to corrosivity, so the field is required to flip the direction of magnetization in the brain. And then the vertical axis is linked to particle interactions. So we basically observe three types of behavior. So um, the first one, which has kind of plots here on the day plot, is shown here. Um, we get a peak rather close to the axis, but with considerable vertical spread. So this is kind of very typical pseudo single domain so-called behavior. Um, people have described this as a pirate hat distribution. Um, and then second type of behavior we see is shown by this sample over here. Um, here we have this really um, distinct ridge along the horizontal axis. So this is usually linked to non-interacting single domain particles. Um, and then finally, we have um, this final behavior here that plots up here, um, where we still have kind of a nice peak along, along the axis, um, so it would be associated with a single domain population, but this increased vertical spread means that maybe the, those are interacting single domain particles. Um, so because these three, basically these three very different end members popped up again and again. I was intrigued by um, Yohan Lasku's talk at AGU. Maybe some of you saw this. Um, so this is um, basically he's developed a technique to apply principal component analysis to the quark data. Um, and this has now been incorporated into the most recent version of quark GML, which is put out by Rich Harrison and the Cambridge group. Um, and Josh, Josh Feinberg has been involved with it as well. Um, so I'm not going to go into the details because I'm sure I won't do, do Yohan's work um, describing the technique justice. But basically, um, you can throw all your fork data into this and it, uh, we can explain all, well, we can explain in this case 92% of the variability in our forks with three different end members. And so these are the three end members, right? And they look very much like those three figures that I just showed you before. Right? We have kind of a pseudo single domain end member, uh, interacting single domain end member, and a non-interacting single domain end member. And so now we can quantify how much of each end member is present in each sample. Right? So if we do that now, um, we can look at the end members the fork end members versus the kind of oxide lithology. And so basically in the, the ones with no visible oxides, you basically just get everything, right? All three end members are kind of equally represented. But then as you start to go to the more oxide rich layers, you actually have this very interesting pattern where end member one here, which is the non-interacting single domain end member dominates. So, and these are in those coarse, really coarse oxides. Right? Um, and then the secondary component is the, um, the pseudo single domain end member. Um, we can see how those might link to Curie temperature of the rock. So this non-interacting uh, end member seems to be linked 
to lower curie temperatures. So this is the fraction of the Ed member abundance in that sample compared to the curie temperature of the sample. So they seem to be linked to slightly lower curie temperatures. This interacting uh, single domain end member maybe is linked to slightly higher curie temperatures. And there's kind of no relationship in this case. And then we can also look, we can compare um, how the end members uh, are related to the degree of olivine alteration because that's been linked to the formation of magnetite in some of these rocks. Um, so again, maybe we're seeing kind of additional enhanced component of, of non-interacting single domain that's related to the olivine alteration. Um, all right, so I only have a few minutes. I'll try to uh, go through this fairly quickly. Um, this is still kind of very much in progress, but um, we wanted to be able to link the fork data to kind of observations of actual domain states in, in individual minerals. So although I should say that's not why I did the, the magnetic force microscopy work, I picked these samples for a very different reason. So um, it's still kind of very preliminary. But if you're not familiar with magnetic force microscopy, um, again, the like five second explanation is um, you have this tiny tip that you can kind of barely see. You have a sample, um, highly polished sample. You scan this tip back and forth across your sample. The first pass, the tip is actually making contact with the sample, so it's going tap, tap, tap across the sample. When it does that, it measures the topography of your sample. The tip then retracts, and it makes another pass across the sample um, at constant elevation above the sample. So the tip's being oscillated at a specific frequency. You can then measure kind of the phase shift of that oscillation, and it tells you something about the magnetic forces of the sample. The tip is magnetized. Um, so it gives you information on um, basically the out-of-plane component of magnetization. So here's one example. We have one of these really coarse oxides. Um, uh, we're just looking at somewhere inside this little square here. So this is 3.4 millimeters. So now here's our MFM scan, 16 microns across. This is showing us something about the topography of the sample. And this is showing us something about the magnetization of the sample, or the magnetic field of the sample. So basically, this is some kind of non-magnetic oxide, possibly ilmenite. Right? And it has little single domain inclusions within it. So these are essentially little magnetic dipoles that are aligned in chains within that, uh, within that larger non-magnetic oxide. Um, and then we have oxides that are largely, um, again, we're looking here, that are largely magnetic, um, but that have some kind of inclusions or exclusion features within them. Okay. So again, here's the topography. You can kind of barely see. Maybe there's some um, kind of exclusion features. They show up in the topography because they're a different composition, so they kind of polish to a different height. And here is the magnetic information. Um, so, so I should say, so white is either is up, let's just say white is up, and black is down. It could be the opposite, it doesn't matter. Um, so it's a very kind of chaotic magnetization pattern. It's not what you would expect from a typical multi-domain pattern. So probably these kind of inclusions, whether they're magnetic or not, are um, kind of stabilizing the magnetization and preventing domain wall formation or, or motion, so making this Kind of more stable than you would expect for a typical very large oxide. Um, and then the only truly multi domain uh, samples I could find were so this is a silicate here, um, and the bright, uh, the bright colors, bright, bright areas here are oxide of some kind that's included within that silicate. Um, you know, topography shows a pretty smooth surface. And now this is really the only, it's probably going to be kind of hard to see. I can really see it. Um, good thing I outlined it. So this is something that is actually truly domain. We have a uh, magnetization kind of pointing shallowly up in this region and then shallowly down in this other region. And uh, incidentally, these domain walls will unblock completely by about kind of 150 degrees. 
So, so these are actually multi-domain inclusions. And then there are also some sulfides, which most likely don't really contribute significantly to the remnants. Um, all right, so, so that's all just kind of at the preliminary stages. There's a lot more microscopy work that we want to do, um, electron microscopy work. Uh, but in general, I think we can say that certainly these lower crustal rocks carry strong, stable remnants, even in the oxide, uh, the oxide rich layers. Um, which haven't necessarily been described as carrying a stable remnant. Um, there's three populations of low titanium titanomagnetite. There's a non-interacting SD fraction that's enhanced in those oxide-rich gabbros, so it probably as those, those exolution features. Um, and it's also associated with the alteration, uh, the olivine alteration. The interacting SD fraction is reduced in the oxide-rich gabbros kind of proportionately and so that's most likely um, the exolution features or the inclusions within the silicate grains. And then finally, there's this PSD fraction, which is probably associated with the kind of discrete um, magmatic uh, coarse oxides. Um, so kind of using these techniques, we may be able to find closer links between the, the rock magnetic behavior um, and the specific mineralogy. Uh, all right, I guess that's it. Yes. Do you have any feeling for what percent to get the fellow uh, versus the dikes versus your rocks contributed when you go over a fellow layer? Yeah, it's probably if you had a typical what we think of as typical crust, let's say a frac spreading center, um, where you have a complete extrusive section that's maybe 500 meters thick, then probably most of it is coming from the pillow lavas um, in that situation. Yeah. And here we don't have an extrusive layer, obviously. Yeah. So. Yeah. In the magnetic layer, yeah. So there is. Um, I didn't show you that. If you look in detail at the thermal magnetic data, um, there is kind of some very obvious evidence of hydrothermal alteration that's associated with specific layers. And I'm trying to think if I've gone back through to just all the core descriptions to, to check, you know. But I, I think those are linked to kind of areas of enhanced, they were described as areas of enhanced alteration. Okay, so thank you, June.